and then I oh, wonderful. Thank you so so much. And then um, I think I can pause, um, but let me know when you'd like me to screen share in terms of capturing information. This moment we can continue to see faces, but I'll, I'll just let me know when I can be helpful in that way. Are we going to do a quick like introduction? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's continue. I just wanted to get the screen share before we went too far. I didn't mean uh -huh. to interrupt the flow. Thanks. All right, ready to go. So uh, my name is Travis. I am a longtime employee with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm your facilitator for this particular meeting. Uh, I work on California halibut in the Monterey Bay area, from Monterey to Santa Cruz, but also go down to San Luis Obispo County. Uh, outside of the work for the department, I'm a recreational fisherman and hunter, so I'm, a, I'm an avid consumer of our uh, state shared resources. Miranda. I'm Miranda Haggerty. I am in Southern California. I'm based out of San Diego. I have been an environmental scientist for four years and yeah, I work with halibut along with a range of other state managed fin fish species. And yeah, pretty much ranging from San Diego up to Santa Barbara is the main areas that we focus on. So going, I don't know, how, going in order around the room so people can introduce themselves. Sure, and I'm wondering, Miranda, I'm sorry, Miranda, maybe you could choose someone and then the next person could choose someone. We could just keep on going around the room. Awesome. I see Douglas first. Do you mind introducing yourself, Douglas, and saying where you're from? Hi, hello. I'm Douglas Caber. I am in Eureka, California. I'm mostly a kayak-based angler. Douglas, are you open to choosing the next person around the room? Um, oh, there's the list. I don't know who hasn't gone. Um, uh, Mr. DeRitter. Do you want me to pour it on the plants or just the tree? So why, why don't one of us choose so we can go around the horn more efficiently? So I would love to hear, I think we can just build on what Douglas said. Um, is it Dorita, Dorita? Can you hear me? We can, come right okay. on through. I'm a sport angler, uh, part of the Humboldt area, saltwater anglers in, in the uh, Eureka, California area. Perfect, that sounds fantastic. Shane? Oh, Shane looks like he's driving. Be safe, Shane. Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. Uh, San Francisco, um, commercial sector. Awesome. Welcome, Shane. Uh, Wayne? Hey, Wayne Cotto. Uh, you talking about I'm Dwayne? Diego. I'm so sorry. I was saying Wayne Cotto, uh, but we can get to Dwayne, too. I'll go there next. Uh, let's go with Wayne first. Hi, Wayne Cotto with uh, CCA California out of San Diego, recreational angler. All different methods, all different areas of fishing. Wonderful. And Dwayne? Yeah, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and just enjoy shore angling. Thank you. Um, I think that might be, it might be Tom and Mary marking. To go. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. We, uh, we fish out of Humboldt Bay. Wonderful. Welcome. And Kay Oda. I'm Ken Oda. I'm a CDFW environmental scientist, but I also am a recreational fisherman, have a skiff, and surf fish. Wonderful. Welcome, Ken. Mike Peary? Let's see if I can be helpful here and ask you to unmute. He just put a message in the chat room. Oh, so wonderful. Not a microphone. San Francisco Bay Area commercial sector. Wonderful. Welcome, Mike. Um, Ryan Gentry. Um, name's Ryan Gentry, spear fisherman out of Monterey, also volunteer uh, Central Coast Policy Lead for the BHA of California. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ryan. John? I'm John Keane uh, out of Sacramento. I'm a wildlife ecologist with Forest Service Research and uh, recreational angler, uh, primarily kayak from Monterey to Humboldt County. 
Wonderful. Darren? Darren, can you come through? Okay, welcome, Darren. Uh, Mike Moser? Mike, are you there with us? Okay, we will welcome Mike and Darren. Oh, and we had Bill D just arrived. Bill, are you open to introducing yourself, name and affiliation? Okay, fantastic. So we also have Mike, Darren, and Bill in the room and we welcome you to lend your voice as you feel comfortable. Also totally appreciate um, that it's okay to, to listen in. Um, Travis, I will graciously, oh, and Kelly with Strategic Earth, lovely to be here with you all. Uh, Travis, I'll hand it back. Okay, and for those of you that said you're from the Eureka Humboldt area, I'll actually be up your way next week training a new hire on halibut sampling. So if you see us down at the dock, come by and say, hey. Okay, so we have a series of questions as Kelly stated we kind of put our heads together and brainstormed so let's, let's find here so the first question for those of you that it does apply to because this is a recreational fishery and intended for recreational anglers but how does California halibut contribute to your personal livelihood especially for those that mentioned they were in the commercial sector if you want to answer. What's this question on how the, how's, how's it affect us? Personal livelihood. How's it, how's it contribute to your personal livelihood? And for the recreational sector, that might be more of your, I mean, it could be for commercial sector too, but more of your well-being. Um, and, and if there is any um, livelihood component, but certainly can go beyond just monetary in terms of livelihood. Raise my hand. Yeah. Never, never hand. And just to say, Mary and Tom, you're not muted, so we can hear you, and we would love for you to just come on in. Okay. Yeah, sure. This is a, that's one of the primary fish we fish for in Humboldt Bay. Um, I mean, you can fish the jetties, but yeah, it's mostly small fish. But th there's a really active fishery uh, in North Humboldt Bay for California halibut uh, pretty much every year. It's 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 a mainstay up here, especially uh, especially for the small boat angler. I mean, you know, our water up here is really rough offshore, and you know, for small boats. That's, you know, it's pretty much taken as a backup. They can always go fish Humboldt Bay, but because a lot of times we can't fish even maybe 15, 20 days a year on, off shore because of the water conditions are so rough. So it's, it's, it's really important uh, species up here. Even when it's not rough, this is Larry. Even when it's not rough, sometimes we have guests in town who get easily seasick on the ocean, no matter how calm it is. And the bay is a safe alternative to take them out for a few hours and California halibut's really the only sport fish you're likely to find in the bay. And Douglas can I ask Caber, a follow-up question on that? Can I add to that uh, Douglas Caber just when I get a chance? Absolutely we have Ryan's hand raised as well. Craig please go right ahead. So and for those that are familiar fishing at Humboldt Bay have you seen that change over time you know looking at the graph we've seen that recent increase in the northern catch you know you guys are the experts at this on the water a lot more than we are you know how have you seen that change over time or has it changed over time um, this is larry and yes i moved here 35 years ago after having lived in san diego for a few years where virtually everybody sport fish for california halibut and i came up here and there was no halibut fishing at all uh, people were just, either it was a very tightly kept secret uh, by a select few, or they just weren't here. And in the last couple of decades, they've become much more prominent and a much more prominent part of the sport fishery. Travis, let me know if I can be helpful. We currently have a queue with Ryan's hand raise and then Douglas. Ryan? So as a spear fisherman 
uh, halibut is one of those things that in Monterey Bay, besides big lings, it's, it's one of the fish that actually puts meat in the freezer without, you know, going out and harvesting a massive amount of them and pushing bag limits. It's something I look forward to every year when they come in because it's, hey, I can make more than one meal out of this fish or feed a decent amount of people. So I, I believe that is how, it, that's the biggest effect it has on our, my recreational take. Okay. Ryan, you still have your hand up. You can, no. there you go. Uh, anybody else? We had Douglas in the queue. Please, Please Douglas, and then I'm seeing Katie. Um, Douglas, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, my experience largely, again, is, is Humboldt Bay, um, but it is, it, it really is a, a gateway fishery for um, folks, both from shore, uh, there is, a, there, there is shore fishing for California halibut here, and there's a couple of, of popular spots, but also uh, entry level kayaks, entry level um, uh, skiffs, john boats, you really do see a lot of the beginning saltwater fishermen um, getting their chops on the California halibut fishery. And it really is, I think, an, an important fishery, uh, not only for the meat that's provided, not only for the uh, opportunity that's provided in Humboldt Bay, but as, as a gateway and in introducing more and more people to, to saltwater fishing uh, and from small boats. And I, it's just, it's as far as a, a quality of life uh, sort of question, which I think is where this started, um, that it's, it's a very important fishery. Wonderful. And it looks like, oh, hi, Darren, a.k.a. Katie. Uh, so yep. lovely there. Um, please go right ahead. Um, so I fish mainly from either a kayak or my small boat in Santa Cruz. And um, halibut for us is a great part of our diet and a great part of our recreation. It's, it's something that's typically very accessible for, you know, with either a paddle or a boat, you can oftentimes get yourself into them. And um, just like that other speaker said, they're big enough that you could eat on it for a few days. You can freeze it. You can, you can do anything with it. So it's a, it's a huge part of the, huge part of the reason we get out there. So Travis, as it's helpful, just at the top of this document, I've started to put a cue in so that you can track oh, that with go. me. Yep. Yeah, and can be thoughtful. It just might mean that you. I might slide away from it, but I'll try and slide back up. All right, so uh, Dwayne? Yeah, I live in San Francisco, fishing the bay. Um, it's just so enjoyable that you can go to, um, there are a lot of locations around the bay where you can catch halibut. You don't necessarily need to be in a boat. It, it, um, fishing from shore means you got to kind of do your, your homework a little more before you, um, before you actually go to a location. But um, it's just a great pastime. It puts dinner on the table seasonally, and it's, it's very enjoyable. The thing that worries me, though, in San Francisco Bay is, uh, during the years when the undersize and, and the small fish are, are thick and the season opens, they, they get hammered pretty hard. And uh, so I, I wanted to participate in this, um, in this process to hopefully get some relief for the fish during those years when, you know, they're, they're, they're really being fished hard because it worries me if that, that beautiful fishery just disappears because of, you know, maybe just being hit time to time. Okay, so any other any other comments on this topic? Hey, Travis, this is Wayne Cotto. Yep. Yeah, so I fish all, all, all over California, and Southern California, we do a lot of uh, surf fishing for halibut, and it's a it's a prize that we target. Um, you know, it, it puts meat on the table, like everybody says, but 
you know, out of the search, what are you going to get, you know, uh, spot fin croaker, or, you know, halibut is really the one that everybody's trying to hit. Yeah. Um, and then on the recreational, on the inshore guys, they're, they're targeting certain times of the year when we don't have the yellowtail and the bluefin tuna and the yellowfin tuna and the dorado off the coast like we do the last few years. Uh, one concern is that during the spawning cycle uh, and they're coming in, that uh, we do hit them pretty hard at times. Um, and I think that's the same thing that's happening up all the way up to San Francisco Bay. Uh, you see the counts that have come up in the last few years. I think the warm water blob has pushed a lot of the fish north um, and they kind of made a home up there and they're thick. Uh, we've seen the CPFV fleet hit them pretty hard while they're, while they're in there. So I, I'm with some people that says we might need to, uh, we might need to watch it during a spawning cycle to give them a little bit of relief. Hi, this is John. I just wanted to add um, uh, to the concern that was raised about San Francisco Bay. Um, in addition to certain times of year or season, um, it seems that uh, year to year there's, there's variation as well, depending upon what other fisheries are open. For example, salmon, when salmon is closed or has a delayed opener, uh, the halibut fishery really gets worked. I'd like to add also that when we would look at the data and we talk about catches, um, especially from the fleet side of it, you have to take into consideration all the other fisheries, like we talk about the salmon, or down here we had yellowtail and bluefin, year round for what god knows five years now um which took the pressure off the inshore market it took pressure off the ground fish market um from the fleet standpoint so i think looking at just raw data without understanding the environmental or the consideration of what's going on um with the rest of the um fishery uh is a little misleading at times well wayne one thing that a lot of us do, we do record, you know, landings and records are always kept, but we also keep notes as to what's going on in the fishery. So it, someone down the line can go, well, what happened in 2020, as opposed to just interpreting numbers. You know, so those, re those records are kept. Yeah, I mean, 2020 was a good example of we were shut down for half a year. Yeah, you know. which might necessarily, you know, numbers are down, but why are they down? And that's right. where the, the internal record keeping really comes in. Like I said, we do a, you know, my project that I, the folks that I work with, we all keep meticulous records and have monthly reports. And, you know, that actually helps with interpretation of curves and whatnot. Uh, let's try to keep moving along here. Does anybody else want to make a comment on this particular topic? If folks are comfortable moving into the second, I'm just conscious of time wanting to try and get to all these fabulous questions. Travis, are you open to introducing the next question? Yeah, let's go. Uh, so based on the definition within the Marine Life Management Act, what does sustainability mean to you? So based on your Calif based upon your experience, is California halibut a sustainable fishery? So who would like to go first? I'll be foolish enough to go first. Go um, I don't have half the years or experience as some of the rest of the graybeards, but the mere fact that for me, halibut fishing has gotten better sequentially for the last 10 years in a row makes me think that in my little bubble, it seems to be pretty dang sustainable. I haven't killed any short halibut that I know of in the last 10 years. I've brought home enough. I used to work as a fishmonger, so I've cut a lot of them. I used to, you know, know what's coming in and what wasn't coming in. And um, the fact that it keeps getting better and not, I mean, literally for me, it feels like 10 years the halibut fishery has gotten better. So we're not talking like an El Nino phase or a Nina phase or a Newsome this or a Newsome that, but like over a decade, it seems to be improving. Where are you and from again, Darren? Santa Cruz, California. 
and I feel like nothing else gets better. But, you know, this is an example of something that's gotten better, which makes me feel like it's sustainable. A very simplistic definition of sustainability is being able to have our needs met without compromising the future um, needs. It's very basic, but it's, it's, that's sustainability. And this is Mike Moser. And um, for me, sustainability is when you can predict what the next season is going to be, have good predictability. Then I think that you can consider it sustainable. If you can predict it, then, then you can correct things. And um, I don't know if we're there now, but I think that's the most, uh, to me, that's the first step is predictability. If I can chime in on that, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in the same boat as the uh, guy from Santa Cruz haven't been, you know, in this for 40 years or anything like that. But when you say predictability, I've watched, I mean, and just to kind of push to another fishery, um, you know, I've watched like the uh, sea bass population. Some years you don't see a lot of them. You don't see a lot of people get them. The next year, a lot of people get them. And now does that mean that, there wasn't as many in as last time. No, it could mean there's more people going out to get them. However, when you are seeing more and more on the dock, more friends get them and you're seeing more around it, to me, per, the word predictability just kind of is hard to say, right? Because we, we always have different effects from the environment, um, from fisheries, things like that. So I'm not sure if that's the best way to go about it. Um, I just think that if, from a recreational standpoint, if, you, if there's a, a, a decent amount of years where they're not showing up or they're not being brought in or all you're seeing is small fish, that would be an indication that the sustainability is not there. When you're seeing a semi-consistent availability of you know, decent-sized fish being brought in on a regular basis and that not declining in a five-year 10 year span, then I would consider it sustainable. All right, thank you, Ryan. Anybody else? Yeah, Douglas Caber here. Uh, I would echo everything that Darren said. Uh, I, I do have a bit more gray up here, but uh, for what he said for the last 10 years, I think that that um, has actually been going on for longer than that. Uh, you know, the, the California halibut fishery has only improved in my experience. Um, of course, my experience is far more northern than, than I think we're 400, 500 miles north. But uh, I, I think that he really did nail it. All right, anybody else? See a hand up, yeah, um, Tom and Mary. Thanks, Mr. Travis. Sorry, you're you're muted, Tom. Yeah, sustainability to me means to be able to maintain uh, fishing opportunity while uh, while keeping well above your mean stock size and uh, up in the range of where you want your harvest management target to be. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to have you repeat yourself at all, Tom, but I'm going to ask you to do so. Um, the, the, the sheet got a little bit jumpy, and I just wasn't able to capture that accurately. Would you mind saying that one more time, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, to me, it's sustainability is to, to maintain fishing opportunity while keeping uh, well above your mean stock size threshold and, you know, closer to your management uh, target levels. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Any last comments on sustainability? You just got a chat comment. 
Wonderful. Tell us all about it. Let's read it together. Let's see what we have here. Mike is asking, thank you. Um, can I ask a question regarding sustainability? How do recreational fishermen view the commercial fishing pressure on California halibut? And so just very graciously and generously, we're really trying to focus this conversation on the recreational fishery. We do have another um, webinar that's planned in the next couple of weeks that will focus on the commercial fishery, which we welcome folk, all of you to join. And so I think, again, welcome Travis and Miranda's thoughts here. Um, but if we can try and keep the conversation as focused on the recreational fishery, that would be most appreciated. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mike. Mike said Roger that. And Travis and Miranda, anything to, to add or amend there? Uh, no. Um, maybe if we had some time in the end, we can revisit sure. it. Or, or if anybody has anything that they've thought of that doesn't shake out through our uh, discussion. Great. That's really thoughtful. I'll put a note down here uh, to circle back. And uh, in the meantime, maybe we can move on to the next question. Okay. So... How, if at all, is bycatch a concern? Remember the definitions of bycatch that Kirsten presented is a concern for the California halibut fishery and or your livelihood. Uh, think livelihood as we discussed in the first question. For me, for me personally, it's, it's almost a complete non-issue from a recreational standpoint. I mean, the, the amount of times that I've caught something I didn't want to catch, halibut fishing, I could count on two or three fingers. I mean, there's a chance when you go home with a lingcod and you thought you were halibut fishing, but in terms of negative or deleterious effects of bycatch, it, it doesn't happen for me where I am. Uh, if I can, if I can jump in, you know, for spear fishermen, obviously the concern is identifying the size underwater before you poke it. Um, but you know, I think there's a large, a large group in the community that is trying to educate new spear fishermen and a lot of mentors out there and people trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. Other than that, bycatch is almost zero. Other than if you see something else you want, and then uh, you can make that decision, take it. I don't know if that's still considered bycatch. Now, this is Larry. I concur. I don't think it's much of an issue. Yeah, this is Larry from Northern California again. Um, I don't California f halibut fish all that much, but when I do, we rarely catch much in the very small California halibut stuff because, as far as I know, they don't even spawn locally. They migrate into the area, and so they tend to arrive close to legal size already. And as far as other species, mostly what we <laughs> catch occasional rock crab or, you know, have your hook land in a clam and it closes on your hook. But really bycatch is minimal in Humboldt Bay, I believe. Yeah, Douglas Caber, speaking for Humboldt Bay, um, I, I guess I encounter a lot more than, than Larry does. Um, not as many shorts, although we do have shorts and i would um on this on the subject of shorts i think that there was a, the department had put out a flyer um a year or three ago that was best handling practices for short halibut and i would like to see that uh put out again maybe uh reprioritized um you know get that information out there things like uh, split tails uh rough handling that were harming the short halibut <laughs> Um, I, I would love to see that as a renewed uh, point of emphasis. Um, as far as other bycatch, incidental catch, uh, I mean, bat rays, you're catching uh, leopard sharks. Every once in a blue moon, there's a green sturgeon. Um, but I think that by and large, the anglers that are out there are treating those fish well, and they're being released unharmed. So I, I really don't see... Uh, that big of an issue with bycatch here in Humboldt Bay and up here up north. Um, but again, if that flyer could be um, redone as a, as a point of emphasis, I think that would be fantastic. 
Just as a aside, I did a video for our R3 program a few months back on halibut fishing for new anglers. And that's actually one of the topics I spoke about was proper handling of your fish. You know, because it is a, important to try to teach people when they start, you know, learn good habits in the beginning. Uh, do we have any flower comments? Yeah, this is John. I, I think that the, um, the effects on uh, shorts is, is something to think about for San Francisco Bay. This year, uh, there was heavy halibut uh, fishing pressure and there were a lot of legals caught early, but it seemed like it quickly skewed to 10 or more shorts per legal um, after a couple of months. And recently it seems like it's mostly shorts being caught. And I have seen a lot of videos and, and whatnot of uh, folks mishandling those fish. So um, I think San Francisco Bay may be a, a concern and would second that uh, renewing those educational materials certainly wouldn't hurt. Yeah. Okay, so I got the, the note from Avery that we're running out of time here. Uh, did anybody have any? Just to say, we've got two more questions. We're doing really well um, I, and love you. Um, speeding us up, Travis. I just want to ask a real quick clarifying question. I'm sorry, familiar with green sturgeon, less familiar with blue sturgeon. Should this read blue sturgeon that's here as part of this I comment? Think it's green. No, okay, those are they're green sturgeon. Okay, great. I, I just misheard. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't putting the wrong thing down. Okay, great. Well, we have both white and green sturgeon up in Humboldt Bay. Okay. That's super helpful. Thank you so much. I've that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Travis, take it away. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, so uh, the next question, getting almost to the end here. So how, if at all, are changing ocean conditions, uh, in the, let's say the past 20 years, uh, impacting the California halibut fishery and then and or your livelihood? Again, how we uh, discuss question number one. Who would like to go? Well, I'll start. This is John. Um, just one observation, and it relates to that the discussion on sustainability. Um, my impression um, from the San Francisco Bay Area was that the halibut fishery um, really declined um, during the salmon closure, whatever years that was, 08, 09, right, somewhere in there, whatever those years were. Um, and that the increase that we've seen over the last 10 years has, has, followed, that, um, has followed that period. period. So I don't know if that is, you know, a direct ocean condition directly affecting halibut populations, but more indirectly, river ocean conditions and water management affecting salmon that secondarily appears to have affected the halibut fishery. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Tom, got your hand up? Yeah, in Humboldt, hey, Humboldt Bay, the, the California halibut fishery is very much dependent upon the, the bait. Some years we don't have a lot of anchovy or herring in the bay, and they tend not to come in the bay when that happens. And conversely, if we get a lot of heavy rainfall early, uh, the streams, the fresh, a lot of fresh water in the streams tend to push the halibut down and out of the bay. Those two things are probably the biggest factors. And Douglas Caber, I would mention that I, I have noticed the the expanding of of viable targeting of the fishery of those fish well north into Oregon. Um, five years ago, nobody was targeting them in Coos Bay. Now they do. Um, so, you know, that as I think that may be tied into global warming, I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but uh, the fishery is certainly moving north. Okay, Wayne, you got your hand up? Yeah, I think one thing that uh, is not widely known is water temperature during the spawn cycle uh, can draw, affect the um, male or female of the uh, offspring. And I think that's part of what's been going on with the climate change. Um, but I've never seen a, a, a study other than Hub SeaWorld working on it with the hatchery program. Yeah, there is there is a fairly good correlation between warm water events and spawning recruitment success as noted by our, the department's base study in San Francisco Bay, it's El Nino, La Nina conditions. It depends on who you are, good for some, bad for others. Uh, halibut tend to, in terms of recruitment and spawn success, tend to do better during warm water years. 
which would make sense in the last 10 years. Okay, anybody else have anything they want to add? Talking about spawning, I worked at Hubs and I fed the halibut for a year and a half. And those guys would spawn daily in Mission Bay. We were we were we were dumping eggs daily. Yeah, and a lot of that is water temperature dependent. I mean, I I look at California halibut throughout the course of our season here in Monterey to Santa Cruz, and there is you start to see the change in the number of ripe running females relative to you know what the SSTs are doing. Yeah. Okay. Any other any other comments? Okay. So let's go ahead and move on to our next and last question here. So based upon your understanding of the California halibut fishery, do you have any recommendations related to the sustainability of the resource, bycatch halibut, or as related to climate change and or socioeconomics? Let's get rid of the gill nets. It's 2021. We shouldn't have to be gill netting fish. There's a better way. We've all seen the graph. I mean, if it's quote unquote, just as many pounds coming in in the other various take methods, it's time. Hey Travis, is it is it the gill net or the trawl sector for the halibut? That's the issue. I mean, as far as the catch for halibut, it's the trawl sector, right? Well, when you, gillnet and trawl both take halibut, but both have their concerns regarding other things other than the take of halibut. What, what is the, uh, what is the, um, what, they, what do you guys call it? The uh, other species that, that are in part of the problem. Is it the rockfish species? Uh, without getting too far into the weeds and commercial stuff, it depends on where you are, though. Because uh, trawl fishermen in Northern California are going to run into different things than Southern California. Right. Okay. But across the board, the interaction with, for example, sublegal halibut mm -hmm. you know, is a concern. That's the sublegal halibut's the one that I lose sleep over. The fact that, you know, the, the gillnet and the trawl guys are discarding short fish that aren't counting towards a quota or an allocation is that's where I struggle with the sustainability issues the most. So just a gentle mention that I, I would love for us to not go fully down a commercial road, appreciating we are getting to, as time allows, recreational fishermen's views on commercial fishing pressure, appreciating the gillnet and the um, trawl rising up. Welcome, Dwayne, to share your thoughts. And, and if it's possible to bring some of this back to the recreational fishery in terms of resource bycatch, climate, habitat, socioeconomics, that would be wonderful. Please, Dwayne. This is John. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Dwayne, Dwayne has his uh, hand raised. John will be right over to you. Sure. Yeah, I was thinking just if, if a more flexible system can be designed that rather than reacting, you know, some years down the line to maybe kind of anticipate what things might come up. For instance, uh, one of the guests mentioned um, years ago, that was, I think, 2008, where the, the salmon season was closed and, you know, all that activity that would have been out chasing salmon came into the bay. So maybe a system that, that can kind of anticipate maybe some in, in increased activity when, when there are closures and other things that where, where, you know, recreational fishermen would usually spread out or pursue other game. There's something something more flexible to deal with the challenges that that are. Thanks so much, um, Dwayne. John. John, yeah. I, I was I was going to make a similar point, and just that uh, 
consideration of um, pressure year to year as a result of other fisheries. Piggybacking on the pressure, at least in my area, I'd love a consideration on the pressure of the, uh, the forage fish fisheries. For instance, the squid fleets and the anchovy fleets that the correlation between them and the halibut's really strong. And I think that there's, you know, I, I think that we can't look at sustainability of the halibut fishery without looking at sustainability of the forage fishery. In our two minute countdown, Travis. Two minute, two minute warning, I see. Okay, so we got the two minute warning. Do we have anybody want to put their hand up to close this out? Maybe I'll just share as folks are percolating on their final sentiments um, that I am on point to report out on what you all shared. I have, will have three minutes to do that. So please know that anything I miss is intended to be captured here in the notes and of course as part of the recording. And I will also check in once I'm done just to make sure if there's anything like you know, big that I missed uh, to have you all help and, and chime in either through the chat or verbally. And Travis, just a gentle reminder that as we transition back into plenary, just to stop recording um, at the appropriate time. And I will stop talking. It is still open for comments. Sure, Mike, go ahead, go for it. Thank you. One of the things I think is really important is to continue the research that uh, fishing <coughs> uh, wildlife is doing on the spawning grounds and the condition of the spawning grounds for the halibut um, I know it's an ongoing thing, but it's a moving target. But I think that that's really important not to be overlooked is the quality and the continuous sampling of the spawning grounds. Thanks. And Travis, a quick question for you. What, what, what's known about the source of the, the northward fish, the increase up north? Are, are they, they spawning that far north or is it mi migration dispersal of southern, southern fish? The short answer is we really don't know. There, we there is some thought that maybe there's a north northerly push of the center of the population, which is a possibility. But with warm water pushing north.